Goedemiddag, welkom bij deze academische zitting. En in deze academische zitting zal uh, de afscheidsreden worden uitgesproken door professor Van der Velde, Rolf van der Velde. Um, we zien uit naar zijn uh, speech en hij heeft nog een verrassing of een verzoek geloof ik, maar dat zien we in uh, 30 seconden. The floor is yours. Um. Dankjewel, promo-rector. Um, ja, de verrassing is eigenlijk vooral voor mijn uh, collega hoogleraren. Ik heb net uh, overleg gehad en vanwege de bijzondere omstandigheden, hitte buiten en een airco hier die het niet doet, mogen we allemaal onze toga uitdoen. Je mag hem aanhouden, maar ik doe hem uit. En, uh, en we spreken af... Dat we na afloop doen we hem gewoon weer aan. En in de tussentijd. Dear Rector uh, and Dean, uh, dear members of the Corona, without a toga, uh, dear colleagues, family and friends, um, this is a skills world. And uh, in the past few decades, research has shown that education has a strong association with all kinds of outcomes in life, such as economic outcomes, health, uh, social participation, and civic engagement. What we don't know is what is driving this association. Is it related to skills? And if so, what is the role of families and, sc and schools in producing these skills? For today, I prepared a special menu. Uh, we were in an Italian restaurant rest uh, yesterday, so I got inspired by that. Um, a special menu in which the two main courses are uh, 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 dedicated to um, discussing the role of the production of skills in families and schools. Um, but as you can see, we have some very nice other dishes as well, so I wish you uh, buon appetito. Um, and I'm going to start with an amuse uh, on the different views on education. And basically, there are three dominant views. One view says skill uh, education is the primary place where relevant skills are being developed. And these skills are not only relevant for success in education, but they also make you directly productive in work. Now, this productivity assumption is challenged by uh, another view that says, it's not about the skills that you learn. They're not relevant for the workplace. It's about the credentials. Um, and basically, education can be seen as a giant sorting machine in which students are being selected and sorted 
on their general learning ability. And this general learning ability is the basis for developing relevant skills on the job. Um, and employers, because they cannot assess this general learning ability, they use credentials to assess this, uh, this learning ability. And the third view says, well, education is also a means for elites in society to pass on their privileged position uh, through education. And it's legitimate because it's not based on birthright, but it's based on merit. Um, and these families, these elites, possess the kind of cultural capital that is needed to get ahead in education. Now, in my view, and this, this Three views are connected with different theories, like human capital theory, credential theory, and social reproduction theory. Um, in my view, it is not very relevant to, to, to see this as a battle in which only one view can win. It's not a, uh, it's not a contest. What you, it's, it's better to, to see this as complementary views in, and to look for conditions under which uh, one or the other mechanism will prevail. Um, and what I'm going to do today is um, I'm going to provide you some evidence on the role of skills. Um, and first, I want to show you that skills matter. Uh, because if skills would not matter, we wouldn't talk about skills production of families in schools, right? It would not be relevant. Um, so my antipasti is about the relevance of skills in work. Um, and First, I need to talk about what I mean with skills. Uh, uh, with skills. I'm going to talk today about key skills. And key skills are um, defined as general information processing skills, such as literacy and numeracy, uh, language and math. It's the same. And um, this is the ability to deduct relevant information, for example, from a written text or from a graph or a table. Um, now we know, based on the international uh, skills surveys that have been carried out since the 90s, that there is a strong association between these skills, these general key skills, and wages. Um, the problem is that this is still compatible with very different mechanisms. Human capital theory would say, yeah, of course, there is a strong association because these key, key skills are directly relevant for the productivity, and that's why they get rewarded. Credential theory would say, yeah, of course, there is a, a strong association, but not because they are directly relevant, but because they are the basis for developing job-specific skills. And as these are usually not measured, they're being picked up by what is measured, the general key uh, skills, um, but that is actually not relevant at all. Um, three years ago, we proposed a way to distinguish between these two interpretations of the association between key skills and wages, and that is what we call the effective skill concept. And the basic assumption for the effective skill concept is that there can be no productivity gain from any skill when it is not being used. You know, literacy skills or numeracy skills can only be relevant in the job when they're actually being used. Um, and so we define effective skill as the product of skill proficiency, for example, numeracy, and the use of those skills in the job. And as you can see, if either of these components is zero, the effect on the productivity must be zero as well. Um, and we used uh, data from a large international survey, PIAC, to, um, to see um, uh, what is the relevance of this, uh, of, of effective skills. And so we looked at wages, and as you can see, both numeracy proficiency and the use of numeracy skills in the job have a strong effect on wages. Now, what would happen if we introduce the interaction term? That's not really clear, right? Because human capital theory would say there would be a strong effect because these skills are directly relevant and, and, and so the product of these two should be a, a, have a significant effect on wages. Credential theory would say there's no effect. 
This is what we find. There's a strong effect of the interaction term, and basically there's no effect anymore of the main terms, which also suggests that there's no effect of numeracy other than by using numeracy skills in the job. The same holds for literacy skills. Uh, if we leave out the main terms, and this is how we define the effective skill concept, the effect is basically the same. So we, you can leave out the main terms, you just need the effective skill concept, the product of skill proficiency and skill use, you put it in the wage regression, fine. So skills drive individual productivity, but only if they are being used. And in a way you could say this is strong evidence for the human capital view, right? Um, but there is some other evidence that points to credentialism as well. And that is related to something which has been called the years of schooling paradox. So since the 1960s, uh, economists have taken up years of schooling as a predictor of um, the um, uh, economic growth in a country, and they found strong associations. Um, but they also were puzzled by the fact that in many countries, the rise in educational attainment was much larger than the rise in GDP. So how could that be possible? And in a classic article by Rick Hanushek and Ludko Wusman, they explained why this is the case. So first what they did, they regressed GDP, so the gross domestic product, on years of schooling, and they found a very strong correlation as other researchers have done as well. Now the interesting thing is what they did is they, uh, they looked at what are the skills level associated with each year of schooling in each country. And they based that on uh, international test assessments like PISA, TIMS, PEARLS, uh, IELTS, all, uh, et cetera. Um, and when they control for these uh, associated test scores, there's no relation left. There's no relation. So, Years of schooling only affect productivity if it is associated with a higher uh, skills level. Um, and again, you can say this also demonstrates that skills drive productivity now at the macro level. We already saw that it drives productivity at the micro level. Um, but we also see that there's evidence of credentialism because in many countries, there's much more educational attainment than strictly needed for the GDP, right? So there's an inherent mechanism in countries to follow higher levels of education because education also serves as an entry ticket to desired positions, even if it doesn't increase the skills level. So my conclusion from the antipasti is skills matter. Now let's go to the first main cause, skills production in families. Um, and here I'm pretty excited about what I'm going to tell now, uh, as you will see later on, uh, because in the past few years I've been working on a, uh, on a, in a company, it was a secret project, um, and I was the unpaid uh, CEO of this company, it's called the Goldmine Company. And the Goldmine is a program that we developed on the intergenerational transmission of skills. And here you see some of the early gold diggers. You may recognize some familiar faces. There's Rick Hanushek and Simon Wiederhold and, and others. There's Bob Jacobs, who is here as well, and Stan van Meulen, who is there. Um, and we were digging, high, it was highly secret, everybody swore secrecy. Uh, and uh, we were digging for the gold nuggets. And what we did was um, we built a data set, uh, what we call the ETS data set, Intergenerational Transmission of Skills data set. Um, and the basic idea is we linked data that were gathered in the 1970s and 80s to register data that we have now. In the 70s and 80s, um, there were huge panel studies were conducted uh, where Tens of thousands of students aged 12 were followed in their career. And those students, when they started, uh, they got a CETO test, they got an intelligence test, we got information from their parents. And what we did, we linked those data to the children of these original uh, respondents. 30, 40 years later, they had children of their own. These children were also 12 year olds. They also got a CETO test. 
And all in all, we matched 25,000 parents to more than 40,000 of their kids. I have to tell you, this is a unique data set in the world. There's no data set, Hammond's true, right? Uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> there's no comparable data set in the world. Not even the Scandinavians have data like that. This, this is great. And the unique feature is because we have the results of the National School Performance Test, CETO, for both parents and children. And the CETO test, you know, some people may have critique on this. I love, I love it because it's the best predictor we have for school success, and it measures key skills at age 12, math and language. Um, and so we also have the information on the grandparents, as I said. We have information, other information on, uh, from the registers on how the original respondents fared when they left education, whether they formed a household, whether they got married, whether they got children, whether they got divorced again, um, what their income was, what the wealth of the family was, great data. Um, and we use this for a number of different projects. And uh, one of the projects that we started with, uh, together with my colleague Bob Jacobs, was to explore what is the mechanism behind educational mobility. And as you know, the best predictor of a child's education is the parent's education, right? Everybody here that works in a school and is in education, <coughs> they know high educated parents get high educated kids. And the correlation is 0.36, which in our data set, very comparable to what we find in other countries and other data sets. Um, now, what is less clear is what is driving this, this association. And basically, we can say there are three forms of parental resources available in the family that help children to achieve a high level of education. First of all, it's the human capital in the family, so the key skills of parents that are being passed on from the parents to the children, uh, like numeracy, literacy, then there is the cultural capital of the family. Um, and this is high educated parents, they know how the system works. They know how to maneuver. They know what are good schools and bad schools and what are good study programs to follow and bad study programs. And that helps the kids to make relevant choices. And this is what we call cultural capital. And then finally, high educated parents also end up mostly in high income jobs. So they have the financial resources to help their children to offer a study place, to, have, uh, to buy a laptop, um, or to pay for private uh, tutoring. Now the problem is that in previous research, human capital was usually not measured. And so it's very hard to distinguish between the cultural capital component and the human capital component in the, say, the contribution of these th three resources uh, uh, to uh, education and mobility. But we could. And this is the result. Um, so if we look at um, the, the, the choice of education, uh, 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 the initial track choice of children when they uh, 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 enter secondary education, which level they take, whether it's Fabio or Havo or Mavo, et cetera, 50% is explained by differences in the human capital of the family, so the key skills of the parents. 30% by differences in financial resources, and this may come a bit of as a surprise, it's a bit higher than people might think, but it's 30%, and only 20% uh, due to differences in cultural capital. Now, this is the contribution of these three resources in the first transition at age 12. And we know skills is a dominant mechanism here at age 12. Well, what happens at later transitions? We looked at that as well, and um, we're still working. Much of what I'm going to say today is work in progress, um, I have to say. So this is all fresh. Nobody else. Uh, already knows these results. So you're the first that I share this with. There's another paper coming up together with Lynn van Voort and Mark Levels. And um, we looked at a later transition, a second major transition, which we define as at age 18, there's no mandatory schooling anymore, and children have the choice to either stay in education and obtain a full uh, status qualification, as we call it. So it could be an MBO or a HBO or a WAO diploma. 
uh, or they can leave school, right, without a, such a qualification. Um, and what is the, re the contribution of these three resources at the second transition? And remember, this was the contribution at age 12. This is the contribution at age 18. So what we see is that the role of cultural capital has increased, mainly at the cost of the role of human capital, while uh, the role of financial cap capital differences has stayed more or less the same. So what we see is that cultural capital becomes more relevant at later transitions. So that's, and the cultural capital, remember, that's that parents know what is important and they can stimulate children um, even if they lack the skills to still stay in school and obtain a good diploma. It's time for some reflections, the digitivo. So one question you might ask is, is this all genetic? And another question is, families are important. What about schools? And I'm going to address that later on in the second course. Let's first look at the genetic differences. Last year, there was a, a, appeared a, a very nice book written by Catherine Page Harden. She's a professor of, of, in clinical psychology at the University of Texas in Austin. Uh, and she wrote this book, The Genetic Lottery. And uh, she's um, one of the leading experts in, in genetics. And she has a number of um, uh, key messages. And one of them is that we should not underestimate the role of genes. Genes are important. If we look at twin studies, for example, 40% of all the differences in educational attainment is explained by genetic differences. Good, genes are important, but they're not dis deterministic, right? It's not like genes convert automatically into a high level or a high, uh, a high school diploma. Um, and then basically, there's a very long and complicated causal chain going from genes to educational outcomes. And it involves many, many social interactions uh, underway. And just as an indication of the fact that it is a long and complicated chain, we also conducted another um, a project, still work in progress, uh, again with my colleague Bob Jacobs and with uh, Matthijs Kalmijn. And here we looked at the role of shocks in the family. We basically looked at three different shocks. Divorce, uh, death of one of the parents, and a substantial decrease in the household income of 25 percentile or more. Um, and what we see is that all these shocks have a strong negative effect on the skills of children age at age 12. So these shocks happened before. If we measure the shocks after age 12, the results are different. So it re it's really about the shocks, right? And just to give you an indication of how strong this is, this is the, the, the strength of the association of uh, skills of the parents on skills of the children of 0.30. What we can see is all each of these shocks have an effect of one third to a half of the total effect of, of skills. So that's, that's huge. What's interesting is that it also affects the intergenerational transmission of skills itself, at least in the case of parental death. So what we see here is there is a, um, a strong effect of parental skills on the skills of children of 0.30. This is the effect that we saw earlier on. But if the parent from whom we have the skills dies before the age of 12 of the, um, of, of the child, the effect is only 0.17. Um, and by the way, it's still 0.30 if the parent dies after age 12. So it's really about an effect of um, dying in the relevant age when children are in primary education or even before that. Um, so it shows you that um, indeed there's a long and complicated chain leading from genetic differences to educational outcomes. Now what about the role of schools? And I come to my second main course. Um, and here I want to introduce another company I've been working on, uh, um, analog to the, the other, I call this now my silver mine. Um, and the silver mine was founded together with Mark Levels and later on with Carla Halemans 
so we were both co-director of the Silver Mine. And the Silver Mine is a, a, a huge project in which we, it's called the Nationaal Cohort Onderzoek Onderwijs, NCO. And it's a huge project to, um, to build up a data set in which we assemble all the relevant information on school careers uh, from primary school onwards until people leave education, for example, uh, until they leave university. Um, as one of the pillars, we got data on so-called learning growth in primary education. And one of the really unique features in the Netherlands is that uh, schools in primary education are required to monitor the progress in math and language. And they have to do this from age six onwards until age 12, so group um, three tot group eight. And um, they take a test twice a year. So there's usually a midterm test in January, February. There's an end of term test in June, July, just before the summer holiday. And we got data from a third of all schools in the Netherlands comprising a half million students. That's a lot. That's a really lot. Um, that's why we call it the silver mine, right? Um, and we got that from, from um, 2014 onwards. Um, and the unique feature is that primary schools, they do not use their own test. They use, they primarily use one of the tests that is provided by a national test supplier, mainly CETO. The period we're talking about, it was 90% CETO test which makes the data comparable across schools. Very important. Unique feature also is that this test assesses the learning growth on a continuous scale from uh, age six to age 12, um, which makes it comparable across grades. So we can see this was the progress in grade three, this was the progress in grade six, etc. And we can compare that. And then there is yeah, you could say sometimes you're lucky. Um, that was the timing, because when the pandemic hit the schools, all schools already finished taking the midterm test, right? Uh, that was taken in February uh, or in early March, and the schools closed half March, mid-March, right? Um, and the end of term test was taken after the schools opened up again, um, uh, so after the, uh, the first school closure. And that provides us with a real unique natural experiment, what happens if schools are closed. Um, now, this is the kind of experiment that no ethical committee would ever approve. Right, Teun? No. <laughs> Teun Decker is the, is the chair of the ethical committee of this university. Uh, and I knew if I would have come to him, he, he would have said, nay, no, no, we, you can't do this. So, but this is what they call a natural experiment. It just happened, and we happen to have the data. Um, and it's very hard to get a good assessment of what schools do because everybody goes to school, right? Everybody goes to primary school, there's no exception. Um, we have differences in quality between schools, but not that dramatic. So. What is the role, the contribution of schools? You can only assess that by looking at, at, at students who do not go to school. So we rely on summer loss uh, uh, results or, or things like that. But this is a far better estimate. And um, these are the results. So if we look at the learning growth during uh, the, uh, the first school closure, we see a large dip um, and a substantial uh, uh, for, uh, for reading and for math and also for spelling, by the way. Um, so there's no question about it. Schools matter. Schools matter. Uh, there is a learning loss if schools are closed. Um, so that's an important takeaway message. Um, what about social inequality? One of the intriguing findings we see if we look at education systems all over the world, the modern education systems. We see that if you look at uh, differences, social differences when students enter education and the social differences when they leave education, they tend to have increased in most countries. Um, and some scholars take that as evidence that 
uh, education serves a social reproduction function, that it increases social reproduction, say, hey, yeah, this is social reproduction. But part of it is just the Matthew effect, right? Everybody knows Matthew, right? For everyone who has will be given more. And that holds in education as well. If we expose highly skilled students and low skilled students to the same learning environment, to the same teacher, at the end of the day, the high skilled students will have learned more and the gap will have increased. Um, and that is just because high skilled students pick up more intellectual stimuli from their environment. So the real test of whether education uh, increases or decreases social disparities is to see what happens with these disparities if schools are closed. And we looked at that as well. And this is what we find. For reading, on the left side you see the difference between high SES children and low SES children before the school closure. And on the right side you see the same differences after the school closure. And you see that the difference has increased. And the difference has even increased more for math. Um, so another takeaway is for math, both high SES and low SES children suffer from the pandemic, but the low SES suffer much more than the high SES. So we conclude that education dampens social disparities. There's also no question about that. I come to some conclusions and policy implications. If we look again at the three views that I presented earlier, the three views on education, human capital theory, credential theory, and reproduction theory. What does the evidence that we presented today tell us about each of these views? Well, we started to show that skills drive productivity, and that is clearly in line with the human capital view on education. We also saw that there is a years of schooling paradox, which is more in line with the credential theory. We saw that skills drive the intergenerational persistence in education, at least at the first transition at age 12, in line, I would say, with the human capital view on the world. But we also saw that cultural capital is becoming much more important at later stages. We saw that schools matter. Schools matter a lot, uh, and they also dampen social inequality, and, and both um, findings are actually consistent with a human capital view on education. But we also saw that financial resources play an important role, not only at the first transition, but also at later transitions, a very important role. So, and that is more in line with the reproduction view on the world. Um, so all in all, I would say, yes, this is a skills world. That's hence the title of my speech. And, uh, but for the most part, right? Um, there's also evidence of some credentialism. And there is clear evidence of social reproduction as well. So yes, it's a human capital world, but there are elements of uh, reproduction as well. If it's a human capital world, there's a strong need for an optimal skills development. That's what we should focus on. But there are a couple of problems that uh, uh, hinder us to, uh, to, to really um, uh, develop these skills in an optimal way. Um, in my book, I present three hard nuts to crack, but my colleague Ari Glebeck convinced me that two hard nuts for the Dolce would be enough, right? Uh, he said a dessert with three nuts, it would be too nutty, right? <laughs> so I'm going to present two hard nuts to crack, and these are the hard nuts that should be addressed by education policy. That's the declining skills levels and the rise of shadow education. I will address each of these um, in a minute. So first look at declining skills levels. Um, this is the results for some countries based on 
the PISA test scores for reading literacy. PISA is a large international test that has been taken in, I think, 60 or 70 countries all around the world. Most of the, say, European countries, the US, Japan, etc., cetera, uh, participate in this. And um, they test 15-year-olds for different domains, math, language, uh, science, these are the results for reading literacy. And for the Netherlands, you see that we started off not that bad. We were in the top 10. I think for the Netherlands, that's already pretty good. Um, but after that, we see a steady decline. And now we're ranked 26. That's a decrease of over a quarter of a standard deviation. And a quarter of a standard devi deviation, mind you, is as large as the, the learning loss that we experienced in the first um, school closure. But that was temporary, and this is structural, right? So this is really, this is worrying. Um, this is Finland. Finland used to be our champion. Finland, the country we're all looking at, it's a great system, etc. They started off at rank one, they're now ranked seven. Still in the top 10, the decrease was not as large as in the Netherlands, but still. Um, but not all countries see, uh, follow the same pattern. This is Germany. Germany. Uh, they started somewhere in the middle, um, and then what happened is what the Germans call the Pisa shock. Um, they were really terrified. So they, what they did is invest a lot, a lot in improving skills levels in schools, and with some success, because they now rank higher than the Netherlands. They've beaten us, again, like, like in 1974. I mean, it's, it's, it's Germany, the Netherlands again. Um, and here, we have Singapore. Singapore started off at rank five. They did a very good job, and now they're ranked second. So it's not like, okay, you start off high, it's harder to climb. No, you can start high and become even better. And I think the difference between Singapore and the Netherlands is the following. In 2014, Singapore has sent a top-level delegation to Europe to visit a number of countries, Finland, Germany, uh, the Netherlands, um, some other countries. And their aim was to learn about you know, how they could still further improve their education system. Mind you, they were already ranked on the fifth place, right? Uh, or even higher. They still wanted to learn, um, and they made it chefsache. Um, the delegation was headed by the Minister of Education, personally, who went to Europe for, I think, two weeks. Um, very bright and intelligent guy. Um, and see the results, right? Um, and that's the difference, I think, with the Netherlands. In that period, we were slowly slipping away in the international ranking, but the Minister of Education never went abroad to see what they could learn uh, from other countries. It simply was not uh, chefsache. And I think there was a lack of feeling of, of urgency. So I think there is a task here for our new Minister of Education, Dennis Wiersma, and also for Robert Dijkgraaf, um, to make this the top priority uh, of the Ministry of Education. Um, can we do that? Yeah, I think, I mean, there is also a change in uh, the dynamics currently. So I think that what, what happened during Corona is that we also had a sort of change of our mindset. And one of the interesting things is that um, I showed you the dip after the first school closure. But some schools were able to pick up again after the first school closure and increase their, their skills level in the second period uh, between September uh, 2020 and March 21. Um, so they were partly able to catch up again. And my interpretation of this is that it shows you what you can do if there is this sense of urgency and also a feeling of all hands on deck and making sure that you, you focus on the basics. 
the basics being math and language. That's what we need to do. Um, but it also involves making choices because you can't do everything, right? So, um, and, and one of the problems in, in, in Dutch education is also that there's a lot on the plate of, um, of, uh, of, of schools. They have to do a lot, um, but you can't do it all. And um, this was nicely illustrated by a, uh, a book that was written by the practitioners Eva Nijkes and uh, Martin Bootsma. And very great title, right? What als we nu weer eens gewoon gingen lesgeven? And I think that's what it is about, right? Um, and their main message was, we need to focus, we need to prioritize, you can't do everything. And the second message is, we need to put, we need to put a f the teacher again in the central focus. It's all about the teacher. It's about improving the quality of the teacher and making sure that they can do their work. Okay, the second nut, increase of shadow education. Um, and this is probably the hardest nut to crack. Um, there were some alarming reports in the past few years, among them from our colleague Louisa Elfers. There was a report by the Education Council. And one of the alarming figures, of, so first I have to say, what is shadow education? Shadow education is all the education that is organized outside the formal system, like homework institutes, private tutoring, but also private schools, right, that are not being paid for by the government. Shadow education. Um, and one of the alarming figures is that over 25% of all students in primary and secondary education follow some sort of shadow education. 25%. I mean, if I compare that situation when my kids <laughs> sitting over there were going, nobody followed uh, shadow education, right, at that time. Now it's 25%. And you can guess... It's not a wild guess to see this is predominantly followed by children from high-income families, right? Because shadow education people doesn't come cheap. It'll cost you a few hundred euro to a few thousand euro a year. Um, and if you go to a private school, it will cost you tens of thousands of euros. So most families, normal families, cannot afford this, right? So it increases the role of the financial resources that we saw earlier on. I said it was about 30, 34%. My guess is in a few years' time, we will see that the role of financial resources has increased. Now, it's not easy to address this because one of the problems is that you cannot forbid um, parents to want the best for their kid and to send them to a homework institute. Unless you're living in China where the president has said uh, uh, that um, it is forbidden. Uh, this, is, this was a remark by my colleague Ari Glebeek. But of course, there are other problems in China. You don't want to live there, right? So uh, that's not a solution. Um, and it's very hard to, to, to address this because there is a, what we see is parents increasingly see education as a so-called positional good. So it's about the relative ranking in education that makes you successful later in life. Uh, and so they follow extra courses, excellence programs, uh, bilingual education, anything you can do to distinguish yourself. Um, but that is a sort of rat race. And the basis of that rat race is that um, there is an increasing association between educational attainment and wages or access to uh, desirable social positions. And this, we, this link has increased over time. Um, and that also makes it hard to address because basically you cannot address this within education policy. This is something for income policy. Now, can you address this? Because we tend to think, well, you know, you followed a university program, so you deserve a high earning because it is, a, it is based on your merit, right? We live in a meritocracy, so you deserve it. Um, in a way, you can challenge that legitimacy, that basis, because is it merit or is it being lucky? 
if we think about, you know, what determines educational attainment, achieving a high level, in a, a top level position in a university, for 70%, 70% is based on being lucky in one of the two lotteries that everybody passes through, the genetic lottery and the environmental lottery. So the genes you're born with or the families you're born in to, and the interaction between the two. So merit or working hard has very little to do with that, right? Of course, they also work hard, but the basis is being lucky. And so that also provides you a key to rethink the uh, returns to education. And um, Nobel Prize winner Amatia Sen um, said this as follows, the rewarding of merit cannot be done independent of its distributive consequences. I come to present the bill. It's it's gonna be a large bill, so I hope I still have some time uh, because in my uh, career of now over 30 years at ROA, but 10 years before, there are a lot of people that you know helped me, so, and I need to um, pay tribute to them all. And I wanna start with thanking the, uh, the board of this university for appointing me. Um, I also wanna say that you know this university has always been very open and accessible um, it's one of the advantages of working at a young university. And by the way, I also want to thank the board for postponing the UM-wide introduction of Integrale Bedrijfsvoering until the week after my retirement. <laughs> um, they plan to do this on the 1st of January, and I like to think that someone in the board said, we can't do this. We, I mean, Rolf is retiring. Let's wait until he's retired. Great. Great farewell gift. Um, I want to thank Hans Heike and Thomas Domer, the former directors of ROA, uh, for always supporting me. I want to thank DJ Fouage, who is still ill, but joining us in the live stream. Hi, DJ, um, for um, being such a great successor. And I want to thank, in particular, Andries de Gip, who was my colleague, but also my co-director for almost 10 years, Andres, sharing the responsibilities of the directorship together with you meant double pleasure and only half the worries. That's, that's great. So I thank you for more than 30 years of, of friendship. And I also want to thank the other members of the, of the management team, Carla Halemans, uh, Mark Levels, Frank Kervis, who can't be here, is also sick. A lot of people are you know, seems to be some virus going on. I don't know. Anyway, thank you for, um, for this. Um, and when I started at ROA, we were with a staff of 15 people. We're now over 65. And I think the fact that it is organized so smoothly and efficiently is largely due to the professional qualities of our support staff, secretariat, finance, uh, statistical analysts, and uh, the quality management. So thank you for that. Um, then one of my favorite projects in the past few years, uh, I already talked about the NCO. Many of the results I presented today would not have been possible without this NCO. And we started that journey seven years ago, and look at what we have achieved. I think I'm really proud of um, this team that worked so hard, both at NRO, you see my colleagues sitting over there, <laughs> and, um, and at ROA to, um, to make this happen. Um, we were also supported uh, by the program committee and by the technical advisory committee, and I want to thank Hermann van der Werf as our chair in particular, because you know he has always uh, very strongly supported us, and he had very, you know, with his wise wisdom and, and strategic uh, uh, insights. Uh, I also want to thank uh, former director Jelle Kaldewey and current director Gea Baas sitting over there, uh, directors of NRO for supporting us. Um, without NRO, this is, this is an NRO project, and without your commitment, this would not have been possible. I want to thank Eugène Bernay sitting over there, Eugène was my 
conciliary, as I call him. Um, he was the one with the Rolodex and, you know, introduced me uh, in his network of, of schools. And um, without that network, it would, have, would not have been possible as well. And I want to thank uh, Roel Boske. Roel um, who is taking over the role of chair of this NCO uh, uh, project. Um, and we started our career together um, at the Groningen cohort. Um, now we end our career with the NCO cohort. So cohorts are the alpha and omega of our uh, professional careers. Last week, he had his farewell speech. And so we end our, we start our uh, career and we end our career together. It's great to do that. Um, when I talk about NCO, I also want to mention Education Lab Netherlands, um, in particular, Inge de Wolf and Tiana, yeah, it's it over there, Tiana Pokisboye. The founders of Education Lab Netherlands, I'm really very, very proud of what you have achieved in the past three years. That's amazing. And I also want to thank Ilya Cornelis and Chris van Klavre, who joined the club, and I think, you know, contributed a lot with their intellectual input. And um, as a result, these people won a major, major grant in the, from the National Growth Fund, 332 million, right? So it's not 332, it's 332 million euros to be spent in the next few years. Not all by you, by I know, but uh, it's a lot of money. Um, then my secret project of the past few years, so I want to thank all the early gold diggers, and in particular, Babs Jacobs, Babs, wave. Yeah, yeah, okay. Babs, from now on, you're officially appointed as the chief data officer of this company. It's a lifetime uh, employment, so that lifetime contract, right? So, um, but meanwhile, the original camp has increased. So we're now over 20 people working on different projects. And so I guess this, this gold mine company will keep me busy for the next few years. Um, then, you know, I, I very much liked working in different international national projects. You see some of them here. And I want to thank Ken Mayu um, for uh, his uh, role as strategic advisor in, in some of these uh, uh, international projects. Um, many of these projects would not have been possible without our involvement in the school leaver and graduate surveys. And in particular, HBO Monitor has been carried out for over 30 years. And I want to thank Christoph Meng and Barbara Belfi for you know, um, further developing this project so well. This was also my fun project. The PhD students, you see all of them here, 15 in total. I very much enjoyed um, supervising you and, um, and you know, being part of your uh, professional development. Thank you. And there are three people I wanna address in particular. Marie-Christine Freguet. Marie-Christine cannot be here, she just delivered, but I know she's watching in the live stream of Marie, hi. Um, Marie-Christine, I'm very proud of what you did in the past few years after your PhD. You, you, you developed your own program on uh, artificial intelligence and future of work. It's really amazing what, you, what you've done. And um, what I very much like is how you developed your own um, style of academic leadership. And I think you are an example um, for us all. Carla. I'm so glad that you, that I could seduce you to, to come to Roa. <laughs> um, it took some time. She's, uh, she, she was playing hard to get, right? <laughs> and, um, and I'm so glad that you decided to join Roa uh, a couple of years ago and that you are my successor as uh, leader of the program and also uh, my successor as coordinator of the NCO. And pretty sure that, you know, all of these programs will flourish as never before. And finally, Mark. Mark, you're not just a good colleague. You're much more than that. And uh, you were my main support pillar in the past decade. You also developed a very, very successful program on your own. Um, with the winning of another award, also from the National Growth Fund, and he beat the guys from the Education Lab, yeah? <laughs> 
392 euros <laughs> million. So great, number one, number two. It's still, you know, very, very good. So thank you. I, and in my view, you are a truly great sociologist. And I want to thank my mentors. Wim Beine also can be here because of physical reasons. Uh, I also know that he's watching. Hi, Mein Wim. Wim Beine uh, introduced me in, in the uh, sociology of education and also fostered my love for uh, panel studies uh, when Rul and I started with the Groningen cohort. Thank you, Wim. Um, my colleague and good old friend, Ari Glebeek, you were also always an inspiration for me and you kept me sharp with your intellectual input. Um, you are an example. And finally, uh, Jaap Dronkers. Jaap passed away six years ago. Uh, I know that he would have loved to work in the gold mine. I, I probably, if there's a heaven, he's looking and he's secretly being jealous, right? He, <laughs> Um, but uh, I learned a lot from, from Jaap, and um, I want to dedicate my farewell speech to him. And finally, last but not least, my family. Um, yeah, oh God, I can say that. Yeah, yeah, but I have to even say, uh, Janneke, I am so happy that you are in my life, and you are just my maatje. Um, Corinne en Hester, jullie zijn fantastische kinderen en ik ben zo trots op wat jullie uh, bereikt hebben. Ik ben ook heel blij met jullie partners, uh, uh, Noël en Nora. Uh, Tante Tiel, uh, sinds het overlijden van mijn moeder 35 jaar geleden bent u uh, mijn vervangmoeder. Bedankt wat u voor ons gedaan hebt. En ik heb lekkerst voor het laatst bewaard. Mijn kleinkinderen, Sarah en Tijmen. Ik denk dat het tijd wordt dat opa wat gaat doen aan internationale overdracht van skills. <laughs> Ik heb gezegd. We gaan weer aan. Changer de cours. Um. <coughs> I don't know if I can disentangle this. This really <laughs> is the it's the bishop's chain, actually. So this is a chain of uh, of the school of business and economics, um, uh, to be more precise. Um, yeah, Rolf. Um, Do you really mean that we should have a di di digestivo after a primitivo? Eh? Mm -hmm. Or a prime, uh, the, the, the primi? Eh? So should we have a digestivo after the primi? Eh? I, I don't think so, right? Because this will uh, end up in a mess. Eh? Um, so, so re okay, okay, okay. No, no, really, uh, what we saw in the past uh, 59 minutes uh, is um, is indeed a very very passionate uh, presentation of research, and, and and while I was sitting there in the past hour, uh, many many thoughts uh, popped up, um, and and one of the things is that you are so passionate about your the, the content of your research and and about the outcomes and about education, uh, it, it's almost like we heard a inaugural speech, huh? so so not a farewell speech and because there are so many things that that, that that you are still investigating you're still interested in so uh, i really think you're, you're you're a passionate researcher and also for the years to come we would like to pick your brains as a school of business in economics uh, as well um, the other thing is uh, you were talking about skills and Uh, last week, uh, SBE had uh, visitors from a peer review team of the American uh, Accreditation Organization, and they were praising us because of our problem-based learning, and especially also the skills huh, in that problem-based learning, um, uh, teamwork, intercultural skills, but also communication. And, and not only uh, that our students gained that during 
die, uh, die education uh, uh, in Maastricht, but also afterwards that they applied it in their jobs. Uh, and they were praising that as well. So, so this is this steps in in one of your 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 your, your, your first uh, outcomes and one of your first uh, suggestions uh, in your research. So, so then a few words before I give the floor to um, to um, um, Didier eh? Didier as uh, the director of uh, Roa. Um, so we have seen in the past years uh, a couple of leaders uh, at ROA, and uh, Hans Heike, of course, as the first uh, director, and he established uh, the institute. And then uh, later on, Thomas Domen, uh, who took over. Um, and then uh, Andries and you uh, were really in the lead uh, at ROA. And you did that in a sort of a shared responsibility that was not seen before. Eh? So first we had to get used to that a little bit, but I think it worked perfectly. And it has been imitated, eh? we know that. Eh? DSM, uh, two co-CEOs as well, right? And also other uh, companies, global companies, um, having two, C, uh, two CEOs, two co-CEOs, and it worked perfectly. So, and we're also proud at SBE to have an institute like ROA on board. And it's, it's qu quite unusual in the landscape of the Netherlands that a school of business in economics has uh, a couple of institutes and also ROA is, is one of the oldest, uh, maybe the oldest institute that we have on board. So uh, really we think we, we, we nurture um, the, uh, this, uh, the, the, this expertise and this institute. Um, yeah, so... I think that what that that is what popped up. Huh? So uh, so we do have a sort of a common uh, education. We had a common education in uh, in Groningen. Huh? I did the business uh, economics uh, uh, faculty, and you did sociology, uh, and we walked around there at the same time. And it was also a surprise uh, to see that uh, in 1990 that you joined uh, the School of Business and Economics at that time, Faculteit der Economische Wetenschappen. So um, I'm happy that, uh, that you were here, that you walked around, and that you're still uh, putting effort in, uh, in, in SBE uh, in general. Um, one anecdote maybe, uh, and, and this is uh, um, what happened in the time that uh, our president, Jo Ritsen, was, um, was, was the president of Maastricht University. And, uh, and sometimes he walked around in our building, uh, usually he was here uh, at the mountain, uh, as, a, as the president, but sometimes he walked around in the corridors um, in, uh, in SBE, Tongense Straat 53, uh, and then always he was um, going to visit you because you were having interesting discussions about skills, and, and he, he wrote a book on that, and, and he was clearly a fan um, at that uh, moment. Um, thanks a lot. Again, uh, enjoy um, the... Years to come uh, with your family, Janneke, Corinne, and others. So, um, really um, think that you um, should have a good time and also contribute still to uh, SBE. So, I would like to give the floor to um, um, Didier. Uh, so, I'm, I'm not forgetting you, Didier, uh, <laughs> your name. So, uh, Didier, uh, please, uh, the floor is yours. You would like to address um, um, as well. Yeah?
played a very important role in, um, uh, in, in linking ROA to the policy circles and in the policy debate with the Dutch language papers that you published based on your, on your research. So I think it's a very great performance. Now, with the data infrastructure that you informed us about during your talk, so the International Transitional Skills uh, Project, I'm expecting many more scientific publications with societal impacts uh, even beyond your, uh, your, 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 your pensioning. Um, what, what I think is much appreciated, not only by me, but also by others at the Institute, is your multidisciplinary approach to the research that we do. And, and it's reflected in many ways. It's reflecting the type of journals in which you publish. So it includes economic journals, it includes journals in, uh, in sociology, obviously, but also in methods, which I think is pretty, is pretty great. It also includes the diversity of the teams with whom you have been Co uh, cooperating in the last uh, in the last 32 years and also your ability to reflect on other disciplines uh, starting from your own strength of your own discipline i think this is something that i learned a lot of, uh, about in the last uh, in the last uh, years that i have been working with you and that others have been uh, also learning a lot uh, from you so Ralph, I, I think you're a very creative person, indeed very enthusiastic, and your ability to infuse people was just reflected in the talk that you, uh, that, 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 that you gave. So I, I really admire the way you look at the problems that we face both in research, but also in running the Institute and your way of uh, you know, proactive, creative thinking and problem solving thinking that you, that you implement when we, when we face these, these problems. And, um, to, to, together with Andris, you did a very great job in, in the positioning of ROA as a scientific institute right into the center of the policy debate. And some of our colleagues even refer to ROA as being the ROA family. And you know, it, I mean, if it feels like that, it must be that Andris and you have been playing a very strong role in the nurturing of that, of that feeling for, for all of us. So I, I'm going to end on that nurturing aspect and the international transmission of skills. I was, you know, I, I, I was looking at your, 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 your family. So you have two daughters, Corinne and, and, and Hester. And Corinne is working in the bank sector, which is a sector typically prone to automation risk and jobs disappearing. And Hester in journalism, if, I'm, if I remember well, which is a sector with rather poor primary, primary labor conditions. So I always thought, why didn't... Uh, Rolf nurtured them better, informed them better in how to read the labor market, right, and make you know more adequate choices. But but indeed, in the end, everything is very fine with both daughters. So I, I'm not at all worried about this. I think you did a great job in the end. Uh, indeed, such a great job that they made you and and Janneke grandparents uh, very very recently. And, and I mean, you, it, it's evident how proud you are about, about being a grandparent. Actually, when I call you very often, say, no, it's not possible now. You know, I'm, you know, I'm taking care of the, of the grandkids. So Sarah and Taim, I think you, you will be a very great grandfather to them in passing through your knowledge and your affection to them, but also the other skills that they need today and that they will need tomorrow in order to be grown-ups and, and function in education system and in the, the job market. And now you have plenty of time to pass that knowledge and affection to them. So Rolf, take care and enjoy the rest of the day with the guests and the colleagues. Okay, thanks uh, Didier. Uh, now it's my task uh, to end this academic ceremony, and I will do that, and invite you to the reception, um, and wish you all the best, and uh, thanks for paying attention and being here. I close this academic ceremony. <laughs>